Hello, my name is Georgina Gibson and I'm a researcher from the International Arctic Research Centre, specialising in high latitude ecosystem dynamics. My work centres on understanding how the variability in the ocean environment influences patterns of biomass and production that we see in the ocean. I grew up on the Isle of Wight, a small island off the south coast of Britain, which is where I initially became fascinated with the ocean. My curiosity eventually led me to complete a PhD in biological oceanography at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I've been at the International Arctic Research Center for over 10 years. My research primarily utilizes ecosystem models to explore the impacts of ocean on the lower trophic levels and young fish. Today, I want to introduce you to marine food webs of the Arctic Ocean. In previous modules, you've learned about the physical environment of the Arctic Ocean, including the ocean currents, the temperature, the salinity, and the sea ice. These environmental factors all work together to control the biology of the marine Arctic, what can grow there, and when. Many of you may already be familiar with the concept of a terrestrial food chain. For example, plants are primary producers able to harness and store the energy from sunlight. Some animals are able to eat these plants and use this energy. We call these animals herbivores, or primary consumers. Other animals are only able to get their energy by eating other animals. We call these secondary consumers or carnivores. Food chains can be thought of as a hierarchy of trophic levels, where the trophic level is the position that an organism occupies in the food chain, what it eats and what eats it. The energy that is originally produced by the sun is passed up the food chain to higher and higher trophic levels, supporting a wide variety of animals. Just like plants on land, plants in the ocean also need access to light and nutrients to grow. They convert carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen, using energy from sunlight in a process called photosynthesis. This process happens in a specialized part of the cell called a chloroplast. While most students may be familiar with seaweed, which looks somewhat like a terrestrial plant, most of the photosynthesis or primary production in the ocean is actually conducted by phytoplankton small single cell plants that are microscopic. Although you can't usually see them with your naked eye, there are tens of millions of them in the ocean. The physical environment of the ocean plays a really important role in controlling both the amount of sunlight and nutrients that are available for photosynthesis throughout the year. The annual solar cycle is relatively fixed and determines the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface of the ocean. So it can be dark 24 hours a day during the Arctic winter and light most of the time during the Arctic summers. The water itself also attenuates and absorbs sunlight, so the ocean gets darker and darker with depth. In the Arctic, the presence of sea ice and snow can also greatly reduce the amount of sunlight that is able to penetrate into the ocean. The temperature and salinity of the ocean work together to control its density. Warmer and fresher water is less dense than cold, saltier water. In the summer, the sun heats up the upper ocean and makes a less dense, seasonal layer at the top of the water column that traps the phytoplankton in a light-rich environment. This seasonal layer contains only a limited amount of nutrients though. Once depleted by the plant growth, nutrient replenishment is dependent on mixing from nutrient-rich waters from below. Production by the tiny phytoplankton sustains all higher trophic levels in the Arctic and thus forms the base or the lowest trophic level of the ocean food web. While nutrients are very important in controlling the total amount of production possible, the timing of the production in the Arctic is mainly controlled by light. The Arctic Ocean experiences 24-hour darkness during the winter, so no primary production can occur. In the spring, light increases and nutrients are plentiful, and the phytoplankton can grow rapidly, producing an abundance of fresh food to support the marine food web. This is what we call the spring bloom. Eventually, the phytoplankton uses up all the nutrients and their growth slows down until the ocean mixing brings a new supply of nutrients to support their growth. There are many different species and sizes of phytoplankton, but in the cold Arctic, large cells called diatoms that have external skeletons made of silica tend to dominate the phytoplankton community. Phytoplankton in the ocean are generally considered pelagic, living in the water column. However, in the Arctic Ocean, the sea ice provides a habitat for an additional primary producer, ice algae. Ice algae can live in brine channels in the ice, but are also able to form very noticeable algal mats underneath the ice. The microscopic plankton and mats of ice algae are grazed upon by zooplankton, the primary consumers of the Arctic Ocean. 
Zooplankton are invertebrates, animals without a backbone. There are many different kinds and sizes which are capable of eating different types and sizes of phytoplankton. In the Arctic, the zooplankton community is dominated by numerous different species of copepod and krill. Adult copepods are about a quarter inch long and have a fatty lipid sac, which stores energy. During the Arctic winter, there is very little that phytoplankton can eat. So if copepods enter a kind of hibernation state deep in the ocean, the lipid sac helps them survive until they wake up in the spring and feed on phytoplankton and ice algae. The lipid sac makes them a very desirable energy rich food source for the higher trophic levels. The other dominant zooplankton, euphosids or krell, they look a bit like shrimp. They're relatively large zooplankton reaching two to three inches in length. Krill are mostly herbivorous, however they can consume smaller zooplankton. Krill form an important trophic level connection because while they feed on phytoplankton, they are the main food source for many larger animals. Fish, seabirds, and even some whales all like to eat the zooplankton. Although very large, bowhead or baleen whales eat the very tiny plankton. Instead of teeth, these whales have a special mouth structures called baleen for straining the plankton from the water. It seems improbable that such tiny organisms can sustain such big animals, but it's a very short and effective food chain. Hundreds of different fish live in the Arctic Ocean, including sculpin, eel pouts, and salmon. However, the Arctic cod is one of the most numerous Arctic fish, and it's considered central to the Arctic food web. It provides a rich meal for seabirds, whales, seals, which in turn provides a meal for polar bears, and walrus, which roam the Arctic ice. So far, we've only talked about plants and animals that live and feed in the upper water column, or pelagic zone. However, these animals can be messy eaters and leave bits behind. This organic waste, along with fecal pellets and dead bodies of plants and animals that died naturally, sinks to the sea floor as detritus and supports a benthic food web. The productivity of the benthic community is dependent on the productivity of the pelagic community above it. The continental shelves around the Arctic Ocean are relatively shallow, so the pelagic and benthic environments are quite tightly coupled. The detritus reaches the sea floor relatively intact and provides a steady stream of fluid for the bottom dwellers. The Arctic benthic community is made up of all kinds of invertebrates, including shrimps, crabs, worms, mussels, clams, snails, sea spiders, and sea cucumbers. Some of these benthic animals are suspension feeders, filtering the particles from the water column, while deposit feeders eat the organic rich sediments right off the sea floor. While Arctic cod prefers a pelagic zone, many other Arctic fish are benthic, living on or associated closely with the sea floor, consuming the benthic invertebrates. Seals will also eat benthic invertebrates, and walrus actually prefers to eat animals that live on the seafloor. Humans can also be an important part of the marine food web. Indigenous Arctic peoples living in communities around the coastal Arctic have hunted walrus, whales, and fish from the Arctic Ocean for hundreds of years and rely on this important food resource for their way of life. So you can see, in reality, on land and in the ocean, the transfer of energy from its original source to higher trophic levels is not just a simple linear process. Each trophic level is occupied by numerous animals that may interact and compete. This forms a food web. Let's take a closer look at some of the apex predators in the Arctic Ocean. These are often the most visible parts of the food web, so the ones that you may be most familiar with. Polar bears have historically been the apex predator in the Arctic, primarily eating seals, but will also eat fish and shellfish as well as birds, eggs and smaller mammals found on land. As the sea ice diminishes, the killer whale, a top predator in ice-free waters around the world, is now also vying for apex predator status in the Arctic. The changing Arctic environment is already impacting the Arctic food web in other ways. Some of the environmental changes we understand quite well. For example, the water temperature is getting warmer and sea ice is diminishing. This makes more sunlight available, resulting in larger and earlier spring blooms and longer growing seasons. Additionally, the heat increases the growth rate of many species and it's thought that the Arctic could become more productive. However, 
The additional heat could also reduce the depth and increase the stability of the upper mix layer. Once the nutrients in the upper layer get used up, it could be harder for them to be replaced. So while the Arctic may become more productive initially, it may experience more nutrient limitation later in the season. The timing of the spring bloom can make a big difference to whether the phytoplankton enter the benthic or pelagic food web. If the spring bloom occurs early, before the zooplankton have woken up from their winter hibernation, the phytoplankton will experience very little grazing and more organic matter will fall to the sea floor and feed the benthic community. Each plankton and fish species have very different temperature preferences and are able to grow and thrive under different light and nutrient conditions. As Arctic Ocean temperature increases, we are beginning to see species in the Arctic that have previously stayed further south. The loss of sea ice is not good news for everyone. Not only will marine mammals no longer have a place to rest and hunt, indigenous hunters are also finding hunting for important resources increasingly more difficult and dangerous and ice algae at the bottom of the food chain will no longer have a substrate on which to grow. Because so many things are changing at once, the impact of some of these changes may not be seen for several years, and the overall impact of these species shifts in the Arctic food web is not clear, but there are many scientists currently researching these questions. We think the Arctic might become more productive. There might be a shift towards a more benthic food web. It's likely that we're going to see some new species in the Arctic. It's definitely going to become harder to hunt. To summarize, all of the fish and mammals in the Arctic are reliant on the primary production by the marine plankton. By controlling light and nutrients, the physics of the ocean determines how productive the area can be. I hope you've enjoyed this module on Arctic marine food webs. In the next modules, you will learn more about fish and marine mammals that occupy the high trophic levels in the marine food web.